So now we're going to talk about non-coherent detection. Up till now, we've always been talking about coherent detection. And there's two important uh, aspects I want you to remember about non-coherent detection. First of all, why does it exist? Why do we have both coherent detection and non-coherent detection? So remember, it all comes down to this idea of uh, three criteria, which are important for communication system. There's sort of the power efficiency, which is sort of like the bit error rate versus the SNR performance. There is something we call spectral efficiency, how much spectrum I occupy for a given amount of information that gets transmitted. And finally, there is cost and complexity. So the reason that we have non-coherent detection is this, it's cost. It's that we can bring down the cost when we use non-coherent detection instead of coherent detection. So this is really the motivation why we're going to look at that. Uh, the second is, what exactly does it mean, non-coherent detection? And really what we're going to, uh, the, the approach we're going to use for non-coherent detection is to say, we don't know the phase. So what does it mean by we don't know the phase? Well, you have to think back to what we do with coherent detection to understand what's going wrong with uh, and, and why we would need non-coherent detection. That's really what this module is going to be talking, this, this video is going to be talking about, is why we need uh, coherent detection. But first of all, what do I mean by the phases known? Remember, in our coherent receivers, we have these basis vectors, the basis vectors, which you know are somehow this cosine omega 0 t and sine omega 0 t. If it's FSK, there'll be a couple of different frequencies. And when I'm talking about um, these uh, basis vectors, somehow I'm assuming that there's this perfect coordination between the transmitter and the receiver. So the receiver is using a carrier. The receiver is sending on omega 0. So it has an oscillator. It has an oscillator, and it's kicking out cosine omega 0 t. Now, at the receiver, remember, I have to, the first thing I do in one of the I or the Q branch is to multiply by a cosine omega 0 t uh, in order to uh, get the coordinates in IQ space, because this is the Q coordinate, I coordinate. Uh, so I assume that here at the Rx, I'm going to multiply here by something that's cosine omega 0 t. So I have the same oscillator. That's OK. You know, we both agree we're going to broadcast at 900 megahertz. We both go out and buy a, an oscillator at 900 megahertz. The problem is I flip them on, and they're going to be out of phase. And also, you know, they're going to wobble a little bit. So even if somehow I got them to perfectly align the phase, uh, with time, it's going to drift. This one's going to drift at a certain rate. And this one, you know, I bought a different component. Even the same component comes out the fabrication line. It's going to drift a little bit. There's some randomness to the drift. Now, here in coherent detection, I assume that even though one is drifting relative to the other, that I follow that drift, and I track that drift, and I correct for it. So that when I do all of my analysis for coherent detection, I assume that they are essentially exactly in sync, that there's no phase difference between these two oscillators at the transmitter and at the receiver. Now, when I do non-coherent detection, I assume that that trick I used to track it, well, that cost me money. And I don't want to spend that money. I don't want to use a phase-locked loop to track the difference in phase between these two oscillators. So to save money, I don't, I don't know the phase. And so what happens when I don't know the phase? So again, normally, this would have some phase offset compared. So there's some phase offset between the two. And this phase offset in coherent detection, I assume that I track it and I force it to be zero. Cost me money. Non-coherent, I don't know that phase. So non-coherent detection is covered in chapter four of uh, our uh, textbook from Sklar. So if you'll remember, I gave a outline of what it is that we're going to be covering in the uh, in module three. And what we're covering is PSK and FSK, only the binary cases when we look at non-coherent detection. So when we did coherent detection, we used MRE and we looked at the full blown. But things get a little bit more complicated for non-coherent detection and they're only the two binary we're going to look at. And we're only going to look at PSK and FSK. And because of the uh, nature of the receivers that we're going to use, which are going to be different, we'll discover that the error probability 
uh, will have to be calculated a non-Gaussian noise. So all of our previous analysis with coherent detection, the noise always has Gaussian statistics. And uh, we, use the, we exploit that in order to find our bit error rate, etc. So we can no longer use that in the case of non-coherent detection because the noise is different. The noise no longer has a Gaussian distribution. So again, we're only going to look at PSK and FSK, and we're only going to consider the binary case. What I'd like to do now is just convince you uh, what gets complicated when we don't know the phase, when we try to save money, when we try to use non-coherent detection. So first of all, for non-coherent detection, we change the form of the receiver. Um, and uh, it could be FSK, it could be DPSK, and their implementations could be different. But there is something that the idea of what we're trying to accomplish, and the idea of what we're trying to accomplish is, like, suppose we had an in-phase and quadrature branch. Uh, we would do um, something that looks very similar, maybe a um, demodulation. So we're trying to use the same approach. But because these phase could be different between the transmitter and the receiver, uh, when I get out, these statistics are no longer going to be useful in themselves, and I'll show you why in just a, another slide or two. So what we do with non-coherent detection in one case, for instance, we could take these terms out of the correlator and square them, square them uh, and add them. And why, why would that be something interesting? Let's take a look at what happens when we don't know the phase and we still try and use this approach of uh, demodulation. So let's say PSK or, or QAM even, they both uh, use these uh, basis vectors, which are the cosine and sine branches, like, like I was talking about just now. And in uh, these uh, cases, remember, we're going to assume that the, the phase is actually unknown. It's not necessarily the same at the transmitter and the receiver. So what happens in that case? Let's take BPSK. I haven't put the data on yet. It's, you know, antipodal signaling BPSK. So, you know, here are the two signal vectors for BPSK. Uh, this is C1 and this is like minus C1 are the, the two waveforms. And they're uh, multiplied each one on a carrier. So I have uh, cosine omega zero uh, and maybe it's, I, I don't put the data here yet, but I want to just describe what's going on with the phase. So I haven't put the data in, but it would be like plus or minus one before this. So uh, let's just think about uh, what's going on here. So I can think about the uh, first, um, oops, sorry, the first cosine term here. This could be like the oscillator at the, um, I don't care, the transceiver, uh, the transmitter. So it's, it's the, and now at the receiver, uh, there is something that's nominally at the same uh, frequency, but it's got some phase that's unknown to me. I don't know what it is. I'm not going to pay in order to be able to find out what that is with the circuit. Uh, so I have to, to deal with this unknown phase. So then I have this little trigonometric identity here because I want to see what happens when I have this correlator where I take the incoming signal um, and uh, we have, um, we're correlating it with a, an oscillator which has a, a phase, a known phase. So I just apply the trigonometric identity, and I get um, here that uh, there's one uh, term, which is the sum of the two arguments, another one, which is the difference of these two arguments. And the sum, I'll have an omega 0 that comes twice, so 2 times omega 0, and of course the phase is there. And then the second term, uh, the two frequencies cancel out. So I have like a, a high frequency term and, a, and something that's down by DC. And it's this uh, term over here where we're going to see the impact of this unknown phase. So that phase is not known. So this is just you know, what happens in a uh, correlator when I come in and I look at the, you know, the cosine branch. So what was sent from the transmitter was cosine omega 0. And here I have a plus delta that wasn't there before. So, what happens when I add data to it? So this is D is my plus or minus one. So uh, there's this double frequency term that is multiplied by the data. And then there's this uh, uh, low frequency uh, term near DC uh, where I am having my data. So 
this double frequency term, I, I'm always just eliminating it. You know, I use some filtering to limit noise, and it's it's around um, uh, this signal uh, uh, in in baseband, and so I get rid of that double frequency. So that's no no problem to me. The problem is the other term. Now. Let's say that I'm paying the money and I'm doing coherent detection and that I am essentially tracking this delta phi and that delta phi is zero. Because it's zero, that means that my cosine of zero is one, which means in the second term, the data is really visible because the cosine of delta phi is one and I get, you know, one half times the, the data. The data is right there. Now, what happens if I don't know the phase? Well, if I don't know the phase, you know, I can get really, really unlucky. <laughs> and suppose that these two, at some point in time, they become 90 degrees on a phase. Well, in that case, I'll get cosine of 90 degrees, I'll get zero. And my data will completely disappear. And so I won't be able to have any reception at all. So it's like, if I am doing coherent detection and I don't know the, uh, I know the phase and that that is not an issue, but if I don't know the phase, I have to live with this delta uh, phi, well, I can't use the same approach. I can't use the same receiver I used for coherent detection, which is why I have that extra box which said square this term. So if I end up getting something that's proportional to the cosine squared of delta phi, and I add to that the second branch, which is something that's proportional to the sine of delta phi squared, and I sum them, then I'll get cosine squared plus sine squared. It'll always give me one, no matter what the rotation is. So that's kind of the trick we're using with a different structure in a non-coherent receiver. So let's uh, go on and see how that works.